Thanks a lot, Bart. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so, um, um, trusted execution, trusted computing. Um, I, I want to start with a really quick recap of something you have probably seen in the lecture by Frank Piesens this morning um, on vulnerabilities in software and software security in general. So, um, it's a piece of C program. I want you to tell me, or I want one of you to tell me who's brave enough to raise their arm to tell me wh why this program is really bad. Anyone? Yeah. It takes input via the get function and doesn't check its length properly. Exactly. And what do you get then? Uh, buffer overflow. Okay. And, and so the question for you is, um, is it actually possible to reach the true branch of this if conditional? And if so, what would you basically have to do to get there? It is possible and you would have to write more than a bytes into the buffer. And yeah, something like that. And then you overflow it and you can even overflow it with executable code and you get code execution um, in the context of that program. So it's a really bad piece of software. It's a very subtle one. I mean, a, a modern C compiler will warn you when you try to compile the thing that it's bad, but um, th these bugs still exist. Like we have lots of legacy code around and um, problems like that are pretty much widespread. Now, the thing is, um, we, we build these kind of environments these days, right? And they are huge in terms of software that is involved there. If you just think about a tiny little object that is here at the bottom, a car. A modern car consists of 150 million lines of source code. How do you ever um, make sure that the interactions in such a system are, are saying that there are no bugs left in these systems that lead to huge problems for society? I mean, if you think of a smart city that's basically a big safety critical system where um, a software bug can lead to Severe privacy issues can even kill people if you, if you go that far. So um, if, if we want to build these kind of systems, we have to make an effort to understand them very well. We have to make an effort to um, find out who the actors in these systems are, um, how they are meant to behave, which parts are critical, um, where personal data is being processed, how we can secure that personal data and things like that. It's, it's a huge effort to do these kind of analysis. You've probably learned something about threat modeling and things like that. That's where this kind of stuff is going to. And once you've done all that, you still have to um, reflect all these um, isolation things and stuff like that in your software. And you have to enforce that this is actually being held up during execution of your programs. And trusted computing, trusted execution, what I'm going to talk about today is basically um, hardware mechanisms that allow you to do these things. Um, now, how difficult is it actually to understand what's going on in your in your software project? Just take take this example. It could be like a healthcare use case from this smart city environment, and it contains like a couple of sensors that might be installed at a patient's premise, and it might be um, including some cloud processing, cloud recording of the data, stuff like that. And in the end, some healthcare professionals, nurses, doctors might want to look at the data. And if you just take this tiny example, which is a pretty standard use case of IoT-based cloud computing and things like that, you already see that the complexity of understanding all the different hardware, software components, user requirements, security requirements that are involved there is huge, right? I mean, this is basically just other people's computers. You might have very little control over what's being executing there beside your software, where this is situated, um, who has potentially access to what you're running there, things like that. It's really, really difficult to get these things right. If you look at these ones, then these might be tiny devices that have completely different um, security primitives built in than what you're known from your mobile phones and laptop computers. They might be like 16-bit microcontrollers that have no memory isolation, nothing whatsoever. And penetrating these with modern techniques might be really easy. So can you trust data that comes from there? Can you trust data that is processed here? To what extent can a professional that is trying to use this data be sure that he's actually looking at the right data? Um, that the whole system is kind of end-to-end -end secure, that nothing is leaked, that patients can be sure that their data is protected and things like that. It's, it's a huge effort. Now, um, I, I get the feeling that to a large extent when it's about data, we kind of gave up caring about these things. Like um, things like that happen like five times a year and it's in the media for maybe one day or two days and then something more exciting comes along. Um, the, the funny thing is that in particular, in the context of smart environments, we should care because we are building more and more systems that 
don't just process data, but also actuate on data that, that might even harm lives if they go wrong. Think of smart cars, think of medical equipment, things like that. So there are a lot of systems around that all of us interact with pretty much every single day. And securing these should be of utmost importance for our society. And if you think a bit further, then actually, you know, <coughs> security vulnerabilities in these systems, they become fairly intimate pretty soon depending on what kind of devices you're playing with. And the typical answer of a security professional to address these um, issues would be to build another layer of complexity around a broken system. So instead of um, making sure that the system that you've designed is kind of as small as possible, as secure as possible by default, you build another layer around it, let's say some, some network security protocol, some Tor implementation to do anonymization or things like that, that might make the system more complex and even harder to assess in terms of security. So how can we get away from that? That's, that's one of the questions I want to discuss today. Um, if you think beyond smart dildos and stuff like that, these things can actually be quite life-threatening. So in 2015, we had attacks against power grid networks um, and people die if things like that happen. If, if you think of densely populated areas like Belgium, Holland, Northern Europe in general, a lot of people would die if an incident like that happens here. So how can we get end-to-end -end security in these diverse environments? First of all, I think we have to understand that right now we are actually quite bad at getting these things right. There, there is a severe lack of understanding here. Um, there is also a, you can't read this, but you have a link on the, on the slides in the, in the PDF version. Um, there is a whole ecosystem around breaking things. So if you want to hack something, you just have to have a bit of money to, to actually buy a broken machine somewhere in the United States or someone else. You can use that. You might buy uh, zero-day exploits against all kinds of hardware. There is a whole ecosystem around these things. And we really have to make sure that we can protect against them. We really have to make sure that we can um, at least protect the critical infrastructure of our society by mechanisms that are small, that, are, that can be proven to be correct, to be secure. Um, now, how, how do you ever get that right? So what does it involve to do that? You have to understand your system, you have to define your security requirements, you have to do your threat modeling, all these things. Um, you have to understand what attackers you're actually trying to protect against. Some attackers you might decide that it's infeasible from an economic perspective or from, from any other point of view to protect against them. And you have to be able to, to do this here as well. You have to be able to embrace change. And if a new attack comes along, you have to understand what the impact of that new attack is and be sure that you can at least assess the impact of that attack on your existing system and hopefully devise mitigations against it. That's quite difficult. In particular, that's really difficult if your system is huge. So if you're trying to assess the impact of Meltdown and Spectre on an entire smart city, you'll probably be stuck because no one ever did this effort of doing the threat modeling and understanding how systems interact, which systems interact, and stuff like that. It's really, really difficult to do that. You need to build models, and you need to be able to enforce that these models, that your security perimeters and stuff like that, are actually enforced at runtime. Um, so that's the whole cycle. I've been mentioning um, threat modeling a few times. That's the basic exercise you need to do to understand your systems. And then you need to understand what is supposed to be trustworthy in these systems. And you want to keep that, um, that, that trusted computing base, these, these things that you per se consider as trustworthy, as small as possible. And trusted computing is one of the um, techniques that can help you a lot with that. Um, only if you have that, you can get here. You can make security arguments about your systems. You can um, make a rigorous assessment that says, hey, my system is secure under a certain attacker model, under, um, under the countermeasures that, have, that I have installed there. And only then that's possible. And in the end, security is a lot about um, setting boundaries. So you, you really have to be able to define what components interact where and where you need security boundaries and what components are trusted in these scenarios. Now, um, what can you actually trust in the context of all the things that we've seen in the last couple of years? So I think Heartbleed was 2015, the crack attacks against Wi-Fi came along um, about one year ago or one and a half years ago. Um, last year we've seen Meltdown Spectre, Foreshadow, and there are more of these things coming up. So um, it's, it's often really difficult already to define what you want to trust and, and which components you can potentially consider as trustworthy. So again, minimizing these is extremely, extremely important. 
Um, and then you get things like that. How can you defend against that? I mean, that's probably still not confirmed, but what do you do against an insider who compromises your supply chains and might be able to implant chips into your systems that modify code at runtime? Is there still a possibility to defend? Probably there is. So um, let's, let's think about a bit more of an, of an hypothetic scenario where you might want to employ trusted computing. Um, that's this one again. Um, if you think about all the stuff that is involved, you, you see that there are different vendors on this side, you have other people's computers in the middle, um, you have healthcare professionals using the whole system who are certainly not security experts. We probably don't want them to be security experts because we want them to be good at fixing broken legs and not at doing computer security and things like that. So you end up with a um, huge stack of, of hardware and software most of which you can really hardly assess in terms of security. Um, let's think about how you could design such a system. So, so what, what boundaries would you have to define to, to get somewhere? What, what kind of security mechanisms would you have to put in place to actually protect, at least against data breaches and things like that? And well, obviously the first idea is of any business person would be to, to buy an insurance, but of course that doesn't help people. So right, we, we have to get to um, other approaches involving threat modeling, involving anonymization, anonymization of data, um, zero trust um, concepts for the whole system design and stuff like that. Now, doing that on your software level is quite nice. And you, you might rule out the kind of bugs I had on my first slide, these simple programming errors and stuff like that, and you might be able to assess their impact. But how do you consider hardware in these models? Or in another way of putting it, how can hardware actually help you to enforce what, what kind of design decisions you make there? Um, You've probably learned a lot in the last couple of days about encryption, about uh, maybe even security rings and operating systems, uh, process isolation and stuff like that. Um, we can also do that at the processor level. So a modern processor can give you um, security primitives that allow you to isolate a piece of software and to even use um, cryptographic functions that are stuck into the hardware, that are built right into the hardware to remotely make sure that you're communicating with the right piece of software. That can be pretty cool, that can be pretty handy if you're in this kind of remote IoT-like scenario where you want to guarantee some form of end-to-end -end security, where you want to make sure that the healthcare professional's computer, when it connects to the cloud, is in a sane state, while the cloud is also in a sane state, you do some form of mutual attestation, mutual authentication there, and get really strong results that actually this connection is secure. People are still a problem, but let's, let's rule out people for now. Um, so the, the basic idea of uh, many trusted computing primitives um, that, that we build in hardware right now is to get from this system view, where you have a layered stack in your, in, in, your, in your PC that involves parts of the hardware, that involves your virtual machine, your virtual memory management, your operating system, your application, to something where the only thing you have to trust is a tiny little component in an application that is a security critical module and that can be completely isolated from the rest. And all that isolation primitives, all these um, authentication primitives you might want to use there, they're all implemented in hardware. So that means um, your trusted computing base shrinks from this to the application module and a tiny layer of the hardware. And that means, of course, that the attacker model, when you kind of, when you're able to use these primitives, shrinks dramatically, uh, changes dramatically as well. So here, basically, any vulnerability in your operating system, in your um, shared libraries, in whatever stuff you're running on your machine might influence the security of the application that you want to protect. And it's really difficult to do a thorough assessment of that whole complex thing. Now, in our model, we can actually protect from all these things. So we can protect even from an untrusted, from a an, from an compromised operating system. We can isolate a single piece of software so that really no one can interfere with it in an uncontrolled way. And if some interference happens, because you might still have a software bug or something like that, you might be able to use um, authentication mechanisms remotely to actually see that the software has changed, that the software is misbehaving, that someone accessed data that he wasn't supposed to access. So that, that's the general idea. Um, there is one implementation that probably most of you have in their laptops already that is called Intel SGX, um, which implements that basically in, in this way here. So what you do is you program an application 
And within that application, you have something like a shared library that is completely isolated from direct access to the rest of the application. So um, the application will create this thing, which we call an enclave, and um, only enter the enclave during execution through something like a call gate. And this call gate is a very restricted way of entering the the execution that uh, the, the the code that is executing in this part, which which defines very rigorously what kind of parameters can be passed, how these parameters are supposed to be checked. So um, you're able to isolate this piece of software here completely from most of your application from your operating system and even from like um, um, cold boot attacks or something like that where someone would try to use a machine reset to get to data because even the memory that where, where this stuff is stored, where the data of this enclave is stored, where the code of this enclave is stored can be encrypted. Um, so that, that's the baseline of what we are trying to achieve. There are a range of technologies around that do that. And I want to give you one use case. So um, Signal, which is an um, um, instant messaging application, is employing these techniques right now to build a system that allows you to preserve your privacy while syncing contacts, basically. And the idea here is that um, you have an open source application that is run on a public cloud, but it's running in such an enclave. And when your the application on your mobile phone connects to that um, to that enclave, it can attest the enclave. It knows that it's exactly the right code that is supposed to be executing there, and that gives the user at least a bit more confidence that he can possibly pass his data there, that he can pass his contacts there and sync his contacts with someone else's contacts to see who else is using this messaging app and um, get some idea of whom he can possibly use it to communicate with. Um, now, when that enclave dies, when this process of syncing contacts is finished, um, it's destroyed and even the cloud provider, even the person who installed the operating system on that remote machine has no access to the data that has been processed there. It was encrypted, it has always been stored in an encrypted way um, in memory and there's really no other way of, of um, accessing it beyond side channels, which you'll probably hear about later. So um, there are a range of architectures around that give you these kind of guarantees. Um, Intel SGX is one of them. ARM Trust Zone is another very common one that you probably all have in your mobile phones and you might be using it without knowing. Um, one that we are working on at Keo Leuven is called Sankos. It's an embedded trusted computing architecture. I'm an embedded, I'm an embedded security researcher, so I'll focus a little bit on this. But the, the concepts I'm trying to get across here, they apply to all of them. So essentially, when I talk about attestation, I, I mean this concept that you can remotely um, get a cryptographic proof that um, the software you're executing is isolated, has not been modified, and you're communicating with the right piece of software on the right piece of hardware. So th this thing can be implemented in various different ways. Um, what SGX is doing is something different from what, for example, Sankos is doing in terms of cryptography, but the, the, the baseline is the same. So you build upon this guarantee and you can use that in your systems and construct systems that are um, highly secure, even from a 16-bit microcontroller that communicates over the cloud to an end user's device or something like that. So that's that's the big picture that we are trying to construct here. Um, so trusted computing, what is it? Um, and, and essentially, it gives you um, a mechanism, a hardware extension that allows you to um, enforce specific behavior on a processor. And in terms of what you have on that platform, you, you basically have a couple of cryptographic primitives and you have things like sealed storage and things like that. Let's go through them one by one. So the first one you need is an endorsement key. Um, that's typically a, a platform key that is unique to a specific processor and that identifies that processor. And you can use that key to basically create signatures that, that tell you that something is actually running on that processor and nowhere else. Um, beyond that, of course, you need memory curtaining. So you want isolation between um, different protection domains, between different enclaves in a way so that even the operating system that might be managing these uh, these curtaining primitives cannot access what is in there. So it's, it's enforced at a lower level of the hardware that gives you certain security guarantees that are stronger than process isolation. 
Um, then you want sealed storage. So whenever your enclave needs to source, needs to store something on disk, um, because the system is going to shut down, the image, the, the enclave is going to be terminated and restarted later, stuff like that. You also want to get um, guarantees that what you store is the same thing you read the next time the enclave comes up. That's hard to achieve, but we have primitives to do that. And based on, on, on especially on this endorsement key on the memory curtaining primitives, we can build remote attestation. So remote attestation gives you the guarantee that a specific piece of software is executing on the hardware you intended to execute on. And I'll explain that in more detail on the next couple of slides, just to give you an impression how these things work. Um, one of the big problems of that is, of course, that whenever you want anonymity, you need to trust a third party. So the system per se does not permit for anonymity. You need a third party that does these steps for you, these remote attestation and decryption steps, and then provides anonymization on top of that, um, which is one of the things that um, are often criticized about trusted computing. So in practice, there are lots of different architectures that provide that. Some of them support IO devices, others support memory encryption, others don't. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big open um, um, research space and design space that we're currently exploring and where we're building interesting systems out of. Now, if you think about what you can use that and you open the Wikipedia article, you find something about digital rights management, which probably a lot of people don't like too much. You find something about preventing cheating in online games, which probably most people don't care too much. And then at the bottom line, you find something quite interesting, namely re uh, verification of remote computations on, on basically on public infrastructure, on the cloud, on grids, on stuff like that. Now, I think personally, this is the most exciting thing. And that's also um, a context in which we've been building a couple of demonstrators, for example, um, authentication in uh, vehicular control networks, in cars or, or um, in cars that communicate with highway infrastructure. Can you, can you get end-to-end -end securities in these scenarios? And that's one of the things I'm researching on. So um, I mentioned, so there's this anonymity thing. Um, that's also one of the reasons why Richard Stallman really doesn't like um, um, trust computing. So essentially, the, the thing that you have to consider when you deploy that, and probably something you have to inform your clients about when you're working with these kind of technologies, is that um, it allows a party to run software on someone else's machine and the owner of that machine might not be able to look into it. So um, if you think of trusted computing as a way to hide a Trojan or a virus or something like that, it's really the perfect mechanism to do that. Um, and, and whenever you deploy these kind of technologies, you have to find ways to address that. You have to think about um, how you can prevent the system to be abused to run um, malicious code that, that can then no longer be observed and can no longer be stopped and, and controlled by the owner of the infrastructure. Um, in particular, in the context of all the software bugs like Heartbleed and things like that we've seen in the last years of um, side channel attacks, of um, even hardware attacks like Meltdown, Spectre, Foreshadow and so forth, um, you, you, you really have to wonder about um, whether the thing that you're deploying as an enclave is trustworthy enough to be executed in that environment. So enclaves, they protect you at the hardware level from malicious interactions from, let's say, the operating system or a library that you're using. They do not protect you against having software bugs within your trusted domain that contain a buffer overflow and allow remote code execution in that specific piece of software. And that's a huge problem. So if a remote party managed to take over your enclave through such a bug, you're pretty much lost and you create something fairly dangerous because not even do you have a vulnerability, but you have a vulnerability that is pretty hard to observe or, or to, to identify by means of a virus scanner or, or any kind of um, um, intrusion detection system you might have on your system. It's, it's pretty difficult to look into these things. So. Um, Trusted computing is pretty cool in terms of being able to isolate small software components and building um, distributed application out of these small components that can be individually very well tested and verified and whatever. But if you don't do these efforts, if you miss out on testing, on making sure that your little application components, and you can do a lot in a thousand lines of code here, so that's perfectly testable. If, but if you miss out there, you run into troubles and design systems that um, are 
as vulnerable as systems without trusted computing, but it's much harder to detect that they've been compromised. So um, I wanted to talk about this whole idea of um, 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 remote attestation and how it actually works. So um, here you have a common microcontroller, a couple of pins around it, um, and you have a remote party that wants to communicate with this microcontroller. So let's say on this microcontroller we install a piece of software, an application can run there. Um, we wire this application up with some I.O. pins so it can do some input. Um, and then we install another application, all working fine. Then we install a third application and it's still all working fine, or at least it looks as if it's still working fine. Um, there is, however, some overlap in memory here. So we don't really know what's going on there, but it's also, since it's a microcontroller that has probably no memory protection, no memory management and stuff like that, it's pretty hard to implement isolation between these things. So something could go wrong or maybe not. The, the question is now, if this little guy here tries to communicate with this application that is supposed to process some data from here, how much can they actually trust that what they're reading out is actually sensor readings or process sensor readings in a sensible way that comes from there? Um, in fact, what we have here is like a piece of software that interacts with the code that you have installed in a completely unpredictable, um, non-deterministic way. So it's, it's pretty much impossible to give you guarantees about what's executing here and what's coming through this channel in terms of correctness of the data you get out, things like that. It's a bit different on a, um, on an x86 machine where you have memory isolation, where you have an operating system, but you could very well think of uh, this bug to be somewhere inside the operating system or somewhere inside a library that you link against your application. Um, in the end, as the remote party, you have fairly little guarantee that what you're getting out is actually a result that has been computed in exactly the way you intended it to be computed. Now, with trusted computing, we can change that. Um, first of all, we can isolate these regions um, we can actually make sure by a very, very tiny hardware extension that this kind of thing here does not overlap with this application anymore. And through these call gates, we can actually define that the interfaces between these ones or maybe even these ones are really well defined in the sense that there's only one function or maybe two functions that can be accessed externally. And there is no other way for a operating system for an attacker controlled code for whatever other code on your system to interact with these application modules. So that's the curtaining part and the isolation part. Now we want to introduce attestation. Attestation essentially relies on cryptographic keys. So um, we add a cryptographic processor to that microcontroller and that processor also processes some, um, some way to store keys in a secure way. Uh, the keys are not here, unfortunately. But what we do essentially is that we um, assign specific registers which can be used to store cryptographic keys. And only when you're, for example, access, uh, executing this module, the cryptographic keys that are being used by that module are accessible. If you change the context, if you're executing that module, then these keys are not accessible anymore, but other keys might be accessible. And now the question is, how do we actually bind um, a software module to a platform. So let's assume that the platform has a key a certificate, something like that, baked into the hardware. Now we can use that certificate together with a measurement of the code and let's say the addresses of the data segments of these modules um, to derive another key. So let's say we hash that module and we hash then the key that is somewhere in, 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 encoded in the platform together with that one. We get a, um, a unique secret that binds this microcontroller unit to this piece of software. And a remote party can independently infer that key because the remote party is probably the one who installed the microcontroller unit and it's probably also the one who installed the software. So knowing these two things, you can actually get that key again. And if you then can use that key to communicate with that piece of application, you know that the right piece of application software is running on the right microcontroller. That's pretty cool. So um, in microcontrollers, we normally do that with uh, symmetric cryptography. In um, larger systems like Intel SGX, you have more elegant systems that simplify your key management, like asymmetric crypto certificates and stuff like that. Um, 
the baseline is the same thing. So you get the same guarantees out essentially. Now, once we do that, we can actually, so that's the guy who deployed the microcontroller and he also deployed the software. He now knows that the right piece of software is running on that microcontroller. And interestingly, by using this transitively throughout the system, we can actually embed, let's say, the, the, um, the cryptographic keys that are being used by this application into this one. That is, I'm deploying a piece of software that is meant to communicate only with an authenticated device driver, for example, on the target device. And we um, stick the key of that, of that device driver into this module. And then during linking, we actually evaluate that we are linking against the right driver module that is installed there, that is also running under isolation. And we get some form of transitivity that says that, um, so if I'm communicating with that thing and that thing works correctly, then that also means that he previously authenticated this guy. And we get this, this kind of transitive relationship where the whole software that is being involved in this commutation chain is implicitly attested in basically just one operation that is being triggered by this external party. And that's pretty cool, I think. So um, in, in the case of the Sankos architecture that we are developing, what we need is basically a um, simple mem memory management unit that implements the isolation techniques and that is a cryptographic control uh, cryptographic unit that implements all the um, you know hashing and crypto op operations that are needed to do that and the cool thing is um, it's a pretty modular design so we can actually um, decide at compile time how many of these protection domains we need and it's also quite um, neat in terms of overheads in terms of power consumption and stuff like that so this is a msp430 microcontroller that in its natural form costs like half a dollar and com consumes as much power as you can have in an AA cell and it runs basically 12 years on an AA cell, which is much longer than the shelf life of the cell. Now, with all these security efforts, we are increasing this thing by, I don't know, are there gate numbers there? So we are, we are not even doubling the size of the processor and we are increasing power consumption by five to six percent, something like that. Um, so that means you're still far beyond the shelf life of the processor and you have a probably $1 microcontroller that gives you really, really strong security. Um, um, yeah, and in terms of what the software modules actually look on the platform, here you have an overview of that. So um, it's a 16-bit it's a microcontroller, so you have a continuous address space. There's no isolation in the normal view of that thing. And what we're introducing is that you can have regions in that address space that belong to specific software modules. So for example, we can have a code region that is associated with a enclave, let's say enclave one, and we have a data region that is associated with the same enclave. And the premise is that whenever your program counter points into that code section, only then you can access the protected data region. So that gives you um, pretty much complete isolation of these two things. And the only way to enter the protected region is through these en entry point functions. And they are meant to sanitize whatever inputs they, they, you, you give it. They are meant to um, be small and verifiable in the sense that they should not contain buffer overflows, that kind of bugs that lead to um, real vulnerabilities in your enclaves. So now we have that thing. Whenever this thing is executing, we can access the associated data. We still need the crypto. So in the case of Sankos, we have one key that is encoded in the platform. That's this, this um, a a node key there, the, the key of the microcontroller. And from that, we derive a key that is associated to each software module. So we basically hash the text section and we take the addresses of the data region. And essentially what comes out is a key that identifies um, how a module is specifically loaded on a particular microcontroller. Now, um, Effectively, the key hierarchy is a bit more complicated. So we have this um, node that is that contains a node key that is deployed by some infrastructure provider, and the uh, node key can be used. It's a three-layer hierarchy can be used to derive software provider keys, and the software provider keys are then the ones that are actually used to derive keys for specific software modules. So that gives you a bit more freedom in the sense that one company can be the Infrastructure provider can deploy the microcontrollers and it can then hand out the rights to other 
uh, other people, other, um, um, other, other companies, for example, to deploy software on that infrastructure, which might be quite healthy, uh, quite, quite useful if you're, for example, in a healthcare scenario and you want to have several um, vendors deploy software on the infrastructure that is there, and still make sure that these software components, although they're running on the same infrastructure, have very little chance to interfere with each other in a, in a security sense. So um, that's what we get out. You've seen that um, thing before. So what I've been explaining here is um, how we do it in the Sankos case. The SGX case does it pretty much in the same way, just that there is more asymmetric cryptography involved than symmetric crypto in our case. Um, in trust zone, you don't have the attestation primitives, but you can implement them yourself and extend the platform to actually provide these guarantees to even provide memory encryption and things like that. So. Um, that's basically what trusted computing is about and why it's so cool. Um, I want to talk a little bit about one use case that is um, automotive security. And what we've been trying to do here is, so first of all, the introduction is cars can basically be hacked. They have a lot of remote connectivity um, that can be used to um, gain access to, let's say, an infotainment system and from that infotainment system um, reprogram electronic control units somewhere else in the car to, let's say, control the steering or control the brakes or control whatever critical functionality you want to control. Now, um, most of these control units communicate over something that is called the CAN network, the, the controller area network, which is a 30-year-old beast of communication infrastructure that has no built-in security. Um, what we've been trying to do is extend that with um, not just authentication and encryption, but actually get software security in there. Because what happens is typically that, is there a better picture? Yeah, well, yeah this one. So, because what happens typically is that um, when an attacker manages to take over a control unit, it might be the radio, it might be the navigation system or whatever, and they are all interconnected because there are features like, for example, that your volume goes up when you drive faster, which is associated to um, sensing rotation speeds at the wheels, communicating them over this canvas. So there are con connectivity everywhere. Um, what typically happens is not that you just take over a control unit and from there on you can inject some messages. No, what attackers have shown that it is possible is that um, you can actually use this connectivity to reprogram software on these nodes, which is pretty dangerous, right? So if you have, even if you have cryptographic authentication of the network built in there, probably your keys are just plainly lost if an attacker comes in and reprograms one of these control unit and gets full access to the memory that is there. So um, what we've been trying to do is um, use the Sankos approach to not just implement authentication for um, the the uh, message transfer in the network, but actually get software attestation in that network and bind every bit of communication to a recent software attestation result. And what you get then is essentially that um, you can rule out a lot of the software stack that executes on each of these control units. They're basically little computers. They have an operating system. They have a um, software stack that implements device drivers, communication, whatever. And on top of that, you implement an application. Application might in that case be your uh, anti-lock braking system, your ABS system, something that engages the airbag, something like that. So there are a lot of these individual applications that execute in a distributed context. And what we can do is we can actually isolate these application modules with their associated drivers and authenticate them in a way so that the application module authenticates the driver. And then we can propagate this through the network. So whenever, in this context, whenever you receive a message, for example, as this module, and that message has a valid authentication tag, you know that it comes not just from any node in the car. No, you know that it comes from unmodified, isolated software that was meant to be installed on that specific control unit in the car, which is a, a really strong guarantee that we've not seen in control networks Ever. So it, it's something that is actually has the power to rule out these kind of attacks that we've seen, for example, in the Ukrainian power grid and things like that. It's, it's a pretty strong approach to um, get security. And um, we've been then looking into generalizing that. And the generalization is something we call authentic execution, which says roughly that um, whatever 
output you see in a control network or in a distributed setting in general, whatever output your system provides can be traced back based on the source code of the application modules that you deployed and the, well, the inputs that have been provided to the system. So there wouldn't be a way for an attacker to actually introduce a input that is not authenticated to trigger an output event anywhere. So you get an end-to-end -end guarantee for a huge network of, um, let's say, control unit that even encompasses embedded devices, the cloud, and devices, stuff like that. So that, that's the general idea of what we're trying to achieve with this kind of technology. Now, um, I've been focusing a little bit on the embedded side of it, but Probably most of you will not program cars in your life. So um, just to give you a couple of pointers, there are companies out there that um, give you access to SGX enabled cloud space where you can actually run such kind of enclaves. Um, there are container frameworks around that allow you to basically deploy a Docker-like container that is then executing in, a, um, in an enclave and gives you all these remote attestation guarantees. Um, there are systems around or um, uh, library operating systems that allow you to take an pretty much unmodified application and compile it pretty much automatically for this context. Because normally when you deal with isolation, you have to work around it. You have to actually um, consider how you do communication between your application modules so that your uh, um, isolation primitives are being respected. Um, that gives you a way to do that automatically. They all have some kind of drawbacks. So if you do that pretty much automatically, what you get is a larger trusted computing base, but you can still isolate an individual application from the rest of the system and even from a malicious infrastructure provider. Um, there are modern software development kits that allow you to develop this kind of software for a variety of um, 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 protected computing architectures. And if you're interested in the the end-to-end -end security scenario that I've been presenting on the last slide, so that, that scenario where you get security from sensor nodes over the cloud to even end devices, um, we made a full tutorial on this, which we presented, I think, last year at um, Dependable Systems Conference, um, which comes with a lot of examples for actually building these systems and giving you um, an idea of what you have to watch out for when you build these kind of systems. Fortunately, it's no time to do it, but what you will do then, if you look into this tutorial, is something like that. So you'll build an application that executes on an SGX-enabled machine, as if in the cloud or on your laptop or whatever, that communicates over a untrusted communication medium through um, to Sankos enclaves, to microcontrollers, does the attestation over that network and actually makes sure that you get valid authenticated sensor readings from these IoT nodes back into your enclave. And there's no way for any attacker that runs somewhere in the context of this host or somewhere in the unprotected context of this um, to interfere with the security of what is going on there. You can still interfere with availability by basically just cutting this communication, um, but you cannot interfere with security properties here. So whatever you receive comes from an authenticated input event. And that's what we are aiming for. That's the essence of this, this whole trust computing approach. So um, yeah, that's the demo setup. Um, I, I still want to get back to um, the, the problem that trust computing is no holy grail and, and has its issues. So one of them is it really doesn't help you um, if you have bugs in your own code. You can attest that your buggy code is running on the right platform, but that doesn't give you any security, right? It still has vulnerabilities and can be penetrated. Um, it also doesn't help you if you don't know what you protect. So this problem or, or this, this approach of doing your um, threat modeling, of understanding your system, of being able to um, compartmentalize your system into things that you really need to trust and things that, is, that are just gluing them together that are not that important from a security perspective is key. So if you cannot define where secrets are processed, then enclaves probably don't help you at all. And last but not least, I think there's going to be a lecture on side channels coming later, but I quickly want to touch it. Um, whenever you execute something, be it in an enclave or be it on a plain processor, you can normally observe something about that execution. Think of end-to-end -end timing, think of 
how it's being scheduled, when it's being put asleep, when it's coming up, how it's using memory, how much memory it's using, when it's writing to disk, things like that. So there are lots of side channels that are really hard to cover in the context of trusted computing. And it's also mostly not aiming to protect against these. So there are observable events that go on on your machine whenever you execute of whenever you execute a piece of software, whether it's in an enclave or not, um, that might leak secrets about um, what's going on and, and how your software is interacting. I quickly want to check the time. Okay, we're done. Um, so yeah, I think that's where I want to conclude. Um, you had the list of links with interesting stuff here. Um, my email address is also there. So if you're interested in learning more about trusted computing, feel free to, for example, have a look at our tutorial um, the whole Sankos platform is an open source trusted computing architecture, so you can basically download the processor designs, the SDK, and start playing with it, build an IoT application or something like that. Um, you're invited to play with our work and learn more about um, how you can hopefully use these security primitives in future systems to build future distributed systems that are hardened and that come with a very, very much reduce trusted computing base so that you actually can do thorough testing, thorough verification efforts, and make sure that there are no vulnerabilities left that still hamper the security of your system. Thank you. <laughs>